Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Cashers United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Aaron, and it is my honor and privilege, as always, to worship with you this morning. And I truly hope that you experience the presence of the Holy Spirit um, among us today in our worship together. Um, A couple of announcements, as always, before we get started. Please make sure you sign in in the little black notepad in your pew. Um, Let us know that you're here, and um, if you are um, visiting with us or or just here for the first time or even the hundredth time, uh, make sure that we have your correct address and information so that we can um, reach out to you as appropriate. Also in your pew are these little orange cards. If you have a prayer request, um, please complete it. And you can just place it in the offering plate at the appropriate time. Um, If the prayer request is by you but for someone else, you don't have to fill out the whole backside, but just put your name on it so that we can follow up with you um, as needed to see how how things are going and how we can be praying for you. Okay? Um, With that being said, um, I invite you to join together in our welcome that is on your screens and in your worship guide. You are welcome here, no matter where you have been, no matter what you have done or left undone. You are welcome in love and grace. May you find rest and renewal. May you find hope and peace. This is what God offers to us. Would you all stand for our opening prayer? (laughs) Let us pray together. O gracious and holy God, give us diligence to seek you, wisdom to perceive you, and patience to wait for you. Grant us, O God, a mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you. Through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as you are able and turn to page 156 in your red hymnal as we sing verses 1 and 4 of I Love to Tell the Story, 156.
Good morning. This morning's scripture lesson comes from the 24th chapter of Luke, verses 13 through 35. Now the same day, the two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but did not find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they, almost, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with and for me, please? Holy God, as we ponder this resurrection story. We pray that it would speak to us once again in new and fresh ways so that we might experience your presence among us. Amen. So in a few weeks, the Blue Ridge Emmaus is going to host their first walk since COVID. So if you're a gentleman and you want to participate in that, make sure you see David Dunaway <laughs> before you leave today. When I first heard about the walk to Emmaus, I had no idea what it was or what it might mean for my life and my journey with Christ. Now, I knew what the title of the group referenced, right? It referenced the story that Chuck just read and how 
Jesus appears hours after his resurrection, days after his death, to people unsuspecting, disciples who had lost all of their hope and their faith in God, in Jesus, just in the course of a weekend. But I knew this story, and it was just a story to me. I wasn't exactly sure how I fit into this story or how God might be using this story to speak to me. Now, I'd had experiences with God sporadically throughout my life. From the moment I was a child, I remember going to revivals and children's worship experiences and you know, being asked that altar call question, you know, if you died tonight, where would you spend eternity? And I remember just feeling the overwhelming presence of God in those moments. And I remember, you know, I experienced God in my baptism. I've experienced God in Holy Communion. There have been times in my life when I would hit my knees in prayer and desperation and feel that overwhelming sense of God's grace in my life. I've been moved to tears as I participated in foot washings and mission trips, but in my mind, these were always these grand mountaintop experiences. And I wasn't exactly sure that this was necessarily one of those experiences for Cleopas and the other disciple. It seemed like ordinary events. Well, I was in a place in my life when I was getting ready to discern whether or not I needed to go into ministry, whether God was calling me into ministry. So I decided that I needed to have a really long talk with Jesus. And I honestly wasn't sure how to do that. Mountaintop experiences are one thing, but ordinary, everyday life was another. So I went on a walk to Emmaus. hoping that in these three days that I would encounter Jesus. Well, just like our scripture tells us, Jesus showed up. You know, Cleopas and this unnamed disciple met Jesus in their grief, in their confusion, in their uncertainty about what the next day, the next week, the next month would bring. They're in this deep discussion with one another when all of a sudden some stranger shows up and just pretty much says, what's wrong with you? Now, I don't know about you, but in my life, when a stranger asks me what's wrong, my first response is nothing. I'm fine. Don't worry about me. I don't let my guard down. I don't allow myself to be vulnerable, especially to strangers. And honestly, mostly, even in company where we know one another, you say, how are you? And you say, I'm good, thanks, how are you? And you just move on about your day. But that's not what Cleopas and his companion do. They take this as an opportunity to be honest and open about all the events that had been happening in their life, in their community, in their faith. 
and Jesus showed up. Jesus, who they still think is a stranger, begins to open their eyes, open their minds to Scripture, to see how the current events of their day have been spelled out, have been talked about for hundreds of years. This explaining to them that Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection were not God's plan B, but God's plan throughout time, throughout history. They talked as they walked. They offered hospitality to this man. They invited him in, gave him a place to stay, food and wine. And I imagine that there was laughter and there was love. And in that moment, as Jesus broke the bread, as he had done so many times, not only were their minds and their hearts opened, but their eyes were opened to see that this person was not a stranger, but someone who they had known and loved. It was Jesus himself. It was these everyday, ordinary experiences of going for a walk, of talking with friends, of reading and talking about the scriptures and how God is at work in the world. It was in the course of laughter and a meal, these ordinary things that Jesus was revealed, these ordinary things become sacred. I think we are tempted in our life to compartmentalize, to think that God is present in this beautiful sanctuary, that God is here in this hour, that maybe God is present in the early morning hours of our day when we pause to pray or read our Bibles before we start the day, or maybe on a Wednesday night Bible study, but but otherwise, God's not really there. Maybe we do that to protect ourselves, or maybe we just aren't open. We just aren't aware that Jesus is in our midst. But as we read in this story from Luke and the other stories where Jesus shows up and he shows them his hands and his feet and his side as he eats fish with them, as he shows up in miraculous and ordinary ways. We are taught that Jesus is not containable. Jesus is not contained in this building but Jesus is present with us in every moment of our life. Every step that we take, Jesus is with us on this journey of faith. A lot of the commentaries that I read remind us that we can insert our name into this story. It says, Cleopas and an unnamed disciple. Maybe it was a friend, maybe it was his wife. We don't really know, so maybe we can insert our own names. Cleopas and Carl. Cleopas and Julie. And you can see in that moment that you can insert your name because Jesus is made known to us in the exact same way that Jesus was made known to them. Jesus is made known in our conversations 
with our friends, with our family, maybe even with a perfect stranger at Ingalls. Jesus is made known in our prayers as we read and study the scripture, as we share our hopes, our disappointments, our dreams, our failures with God. Jesus is made known. Jesus is made known in our joy as well as our sorrow. Jesus is made known in the breaking of the bread. Not just when we offer Holy Communion, but each and every time we sit down at a meal. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, says that God is revealed and understood through scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. That Jesus is revealed in this life and in this encounter on the road to Emmaus, but also on every road we walk, every life experience we have, Jesus is revealed. What I learned on my walk to Emmaus was to see Jesus in all the ordinary things. It taught me to see Jesus in expected and unexpected places and people. The thing is, Jesus is available to us any time and every time we open our hearts to experience it. Whether it's the warmth of the sun on a beautiful day like today, Whether it's talking and sharing your vulnerable moments with someone you trust. Whether it's reading the Bible and sharing about it with others. Jesus reminds Cleopas and us that it isn't just that Jesus swoops in and rescues us from all the horrible things of life that Jesus is going to take us away from the experiences of this life. But instead that Jesus is in this life, in these experiences. That Jesus walks with us through good times and bad. And this is Jesus' gift to each and every one of us. All we have to be is open to receive it. To begin each day asking Jesus to be made known. In love, in conviction, in joy and in sorrow, in expected and unexpected, ordinary, and extraordinary ways so that we can know without a doubt, so that you can know without a doubt that you are loved and you are never alone. Amen.
we prepare to go to the Lord in prayer, I wanted to offer an opportunity for you all to share any prayer concerns that you have or any joys that you would like to celebrate. Absolutely, it is wonderful to have Terry and Wendy back with us, as well as so many others. They're, people are starting to trickle in. Yes, JC? Yes. Two Sundays in a row. It's wonderful. Absolutely. So it is definitely a blessing to have Helen with us. For those of you who are watching us online and couldn't see and hear that, that was Helen Moore. She's 104 years old, and uh, she just wanted to say thank you for all of our prayers and um, cards and all the other things for her birthday that she had just a couple weeks ago. Um, we got word a about two weeks ago, right before Easter, um, that Roberta Montgomery, Vanna's um, daughter, that has been, uh, had been diagnosed with cancer, was um, finished all her treatments and has been determined cancer-free. So that is definitely a praise. Absolutely. Um, are there others? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, we are so grateful for this beautiful, beautiful spring day. For the birds that are singing, the flowers that are blooming, the warmth of the sun that is bringing our earth alive again. It is our perennial experience of resurrection. When trees that looked dead throughout the winter burst into that beautiful new green each spring. Lord, we pray that you would help us to see resurrection experiences in our own life each and every day. The opportunity to grow from our mistakes, to move forward in your grace and in your love. To experience healing and wholeness, whether we are three or a hundred plus. We are grateful for each and every breath you give us, each and every opportunity to have, that we have to see you, you and your love at work, to witness your presence, your encouragement, your strength, each and every day. So, Lord, we pray that you would continue to reveal yourself to us through times of illness. We pray for your healing. In our moments of strength, we pray that you would use us to be agents of healing for others. Lord, we pray that you would continue to be at work in our world, especially in the Ukraine. They have the beautiful opportunity as a nation to experience Easter twice. With Eastern Orthodox Easter today. Lord, we pray for your peace your love, your power to overcome violence and war. 
not only in foreign lands, but even in our own hearts. We are all capable of hurting and being hurt. So, Lord, we pray that you would put a right spirit within us. That we would seek to do your will in all that we do. So that not only would our love for you increase, but that that love would overflow into the abundance of love that we offer to others. Lord, all this we ask in your holy name as we pray together our family's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to give our gifts to God this morning, um, I just wanted to share that our April Mission of the Month has been the Wesley Foundation at Western. And um, Jay had the pleasure of going to Lake Genaleski yesterday and helping out with their um, annual golf fundraiser. And um, because of your generosity, um, because of your gifts through this church, we are able to support them um, and to invite college kids to faith. You know, college is often a time when people wander away from church, from a relationship with Christ. And so the Wesley Foundation for 75 years has been helping college kids navigate those questions, maintain their relationship with Christ, grow in their relationship with Christ, and for some, come to that relationship for the very first time. So thank you for your continued support of these ministries. At this time, I invite us to give our gifts to God.
stand for doxology. <laughs> After that offertory, I thought Pastor Aaron was going to say, amen, you're dismissed. <laughs> you played it just like I had taught you, Brian. That was very good. You did well, Pastor. Thank you. Um, a couple of announcements uh, that are highlighted in your bulletin and insert. Um, the last couple of weeks, and as we have more people come back, um, we'd love for everybody to wear their name tags so we all know one another. Um, your lay reader is delinquent this morning because my name tag is in my car, which is being serviced in Asheville. Um, I was so overjoyed that I was getting a loaner that I forgot all of the important items like my name tag, my phone charger, my hair gel. No. Um, <laughs> but if we can just remember to wear those in the weeks going forward, um, I think we would all appreciate knowing who we're in worship with. Um, in March, there was a small group from our church that met with some consultants from the Western North Carolina Conference uh, to discuss growth and uh, opportunities for the church in growth. And um, we'd like to share that insight with, uh, with the entire church. So on Sunday, May 1st at 1130, right after the service, um, there will be a transformational town hall uh, where that information will be shared with the congregation and if you aren't able to make it then, there's going to be a, a hybrid meeting on Tuesday, May 3rd at 2 o'clock. Um, also, uh, there will be a Bible study starting on Wednesday, May 11th for three consecutive weeks at 5 o'clock. On Wednesdays, um, it's going to be a dive into the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer. Um, Participant books are available, so if you have interest, just let the church office know on that. Uh, and then lastly, you can mark your calendar now for the aforementioned Brian Heller's uh, Spring Recital, which is going to feature students uh, who are lucky enough to be taught the piano by Brian. And that'll be uh, Tuesday, May 3rd, here in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock. And um, the best part is it's free. It's not the best part, but it's an additional part. <laughs> one last quick reminder, or two actually, if you want one of these beautiful lilies to plant in your yard or simply enjoy in your home, please take one with you. Um, and if you have an affinity for painting and you want to come hang out with the youth this afternoon, we're going to be painting the yellow room, um, a more muted cream <laughs> color. Um, this afternoon, we're um, kind of rehabbing it to make it feel more cozy for, um, for our youth. So if you would like to participate in that, we would love the help. So at this time, I invite you to stand for our affirmation of faith. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. 
My prayer as you leave this sacred and holy space, that as you leave these doors, that you go with the awareness that Jesus goes with you. I pray that you can see him in the face of your family, of your friends, and of each person you meet. And that as you go in that awareness, you would be able to receive the abundance of God's love for you and to reflect that back at all those you meet. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.